Welcome to New Letters on the Air. Today we'll hear a reading by poet Rita Dove. Rita Dove was born and raised in Ohio and now lives in Tempe, Arizona, where she is Associate Professor of English at Arizona State University. A member of the editorial board of National Forum and a contributing and advisory editor of Callaloo, a Black South Journal of Arts and Letters, Rita Dove has been honored with a National Endowment for the Arts Grant and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Today, the young poet will read from two of her volumes of poetry, The Yellow House on the Corner and Museum, and she'll also give us a preview of her third book to be released next year by Carnegie Mellon University Press. We recorded Rita Dove at the Associated Writing Programs Conference in San Diego. She begins with a poem from The Yellow House on the Corner. This first one was started by an experience I had in Germany for the first time. Um, I used to have to walk past a house on the way to the university that was an eight, had an eight-foot wall around it and was covered with ivy, and behind it there were thousands of birds. It was the only house on a mile-long walk that was like this. Um, in it, I tried to use German words uh, which do mean something in the context of the poem, but also I think you can get that meaning from their sound. You don't have to know what they mean. The Bird Frau. When the boys came home, everything stopped the way he left it. Her apron, the back stairs, the sun losing altitude over France as the birds scared up from the fields a whirring curtain of flack. Barmherzigkeit, her son, her man. She went inside, fed the parakeet, broke its neck. Spätzle bubbling on the stove, wind chimes tinkling above the steam, her face in the hall mirror bloated, a heart. Let everything go wild, blue jays, crows. She hung soot from branches, the air quick around her head with tiny spastic machinery, starlings, finches, her head a crown of feathers. She ate less, grew lighter, air tunneling through bone, singing a small song. Ein Liedchen, Kinder. The children ran away. She moved about the yard like an old rag bird. Still at war, she rose at dawn, watching out for Rudy, come home on crutches, the thin legs balancing his atom of life. My second uh, book of poems, Museum, I tried to deal with artifacts of the imagination, um, moments in history or, or people in history whose images have been frozen by our imaginations or our memory or by history books, often though people who, who are not the important ones. I'd like to start off with the poem from which the cover photograph is taken. And the painting is of two sideshow entertainers who appeared with a circus in uh, Berlin in 1929. The man was a white man who had a deformity so that his chest looked caved in as if he had wings underneath it. The woman was a black uh, princess from Madagascar. There was nothing really freakish about her except that she... Uh, was black in Berlin in 1929, and they appeared together for maximum effect. Augusta the Winged Man and Rasha the Black Dove. Shad paced the length of his studio and stopped at the wall, staring at a blank space. Behind him, the clang and hum of Hardenberg's Tasse, its automobiles and organ grinders. Quarter to five. His eyes traveled to the plaster scroll work on the ceiling. Did that hold back heaven? He could not leave his skin. Once he'd painted himself in a new one, silk green, worn like a shirt. He thought of Russia so far from Madagascar, turning slowly in place as the boa constrictor coiled counterwise its heavy love. How the spectators gawked 
exhaling beer and sour herring sighs. When the tent lights dimmed, Rasha went back to her trailer and plucked a chicken for dinner. The canvas, not his eye, was merciless. He remembered Katya, the Russian aristocrat, late for every sitting, still fleeing the October Revolution, how she clutched her sides and said not one word. Whereas Augusta, the doorbell rang, was always on time, lip curled as he spoke in wonder of women trailing backstage to offer him the consummate bloom of their lust. Shad would place him on a throne, a white sheet tucked over his loins, the black suit jacket thrown off like a cloak. Augusta had told him of the medical students at the Charité, that chill arena where he perched on a cot, his torso exposed, its crests and fins a colony of birds trying to get out. And the students, lumps caught in their throats, taking notes. Ah, Rasha's foot on the stair. She moved slowly, as if she carried the snake around her body, always. Once she brought fresh eggs into the studio, flecked and warm as breath. Augusta in classical drapery then, and Rasha at his feet, without passion. Not the canvas, but their gaze. So calm was merciless. The next two pieces are companion poems. Boccaccio had an idealized love, Fiametta who always seemed to prove unfaithful in his work. And uh, actually, these poems began with a fascination for the plague. I wanted Fiametta to finally reply to these years of malignment. Boccaccio, The Plague Years. Even at night, the air rang and rang. Through the thick swirled glass, he watched the priests sweep past in their peaked hoods, collecting death. On each stoop, a dish burning sweet, clotted smoke. He closed his eyes to hear the slap of flesh onto flesh, a liquid crack like a grape as it breaks on the tongue. As a boy, he had slipped along the same streets, in love with he didn't know whom. Oh, the reeded sonatinas and torch flick on the chill slick sides of the bridge and steam rising in plumes from the slaughterhouse vents. Twenty years. Rolling out of the light, he leaned his cheek against the rows of bound leather. Cool water. Fiametta. He had described her a hundred ways each time she had proven unfaithful. If only he could crack this city in two so the moon would scour the wormed streets clean. Or walk away from it all, simply falling in love again. Fiametta breaks her peace. I've watched them, Mother, and I know the signs. The first day, rigor. Staggering like drunks, they ram the room's sharp edges with the most delicate bodily parts and feel no pain. Unable to sleep, they shiver beneath all the quilts in the house, panic gnawing a silver path to the brain. Day two is fever, the bright stream clogged, eyes rodent red. No one weeps anymore, just waits, for a peer they must in the armpits at the groin, hard, blackened apples. Then, at least, there is certainty, an odd kind of relief. A cross comes on the door. A few worthy citizens gather possessions around them and spend time with fine foods, wine, and music, 
behind closed drapes. Having left the world already, they are surprised when the world finds them again. Still others carouse from tavern to tavern, doing exactly as they please. And to think he wanted me beautiful, to be his fresh air and my breast's two soft, spiced promises. Stand still, he said once, and let me admire you. All is infection, mother, and avarice, and self-pity, and fear. We shall sit quietly in this room, and I think we'll be spared. I had the privilege of hearing the blues singer champion Jack Dupree a few years ago um, he was touring touring Europe he's um, been living there for the past few years um, when I saw him he had a running monologue uh, between numbers in which he's instead of saying Confucius say he would attribute everything to Shakespeare so it was Shakespeare say Shakespeare say he drums the piano wood crowing champion Jack in love and in debt in a tan walking suit with a flag on the pocket with a red eye for women with a diamond studded ear with sand in a mouthful of mush poor me poor me I keep on drifting like a ship out on the sea that afternoon, two students from the Academy showed him the town. Munich was misbehaving, whipping his ass to ice while his shoes soaked through. His guides pointed at a clock in a blue-tiled house. And tonight, every song he sings is written by Shakespeare and his mother-in-law. I love you, baby, but it don't mean a goddamn thing. In trouble with every woman he's ever known, all of them ugly skinny legs, lie gap waiting behind the lips to suck him in. Going down slow, crooning, Shakespeare say man must be careful what he kiss when he drunk. Going down for the third set past the stragglers at the bar, the bourbon in his hand, some bitch's cold, wet heart, the whole joint stinking on beer, in love and winning now, so even the mistakes sound like jazz. Poor me, moaning so no one hears. My home's in Louisiana, my voice is wrong, I'm broke and can't hold my piss. My mother told me there'd be days like this. My father was an amateur astronomer at one time and he bought a telescope and set it up in the side yard which has since become a lot for another house and used to show us in the summer Saturn and Jupiter and the moon a father out walking on the lawn five rings light your approach across the dark you're lonely anyone can tell so many of you trembling at the center the thick dark root out here on a lawn 21 years gone under the haunches of a neighbor's house american beauties lining a driveway the mirror image of your own you wander waiting to be discovered what can i say to a body that merely looks like you the willow infatuated with its surroundings quakes not that violent orgasm, nor the vain promise of a rose relinquishing its famous scent all for you. No, not even the single brilliant feather a blue jay loses in flight, which dangles momentarily azure scimitar above the warm eaves of your house. Nothing can change this travesty, this magician's skew of scarves issuing from an opaque heart. Who sees you anyway 
except at night and with a fantastic eye. If only you were bright enough to touch. You're listening to New Letters on the Air and poet Rita Dove. Next, we'll hear a preview of Rita Dove's upcoming book, Thomas and Beulah. But first, I ask the poet how she came to live in Germany. The first time I was in Germany was in 1974. It was right after uh, undergraduate school. I had a Fulbright for a year, and I was in southern Germany. And I went to the university and did that whole thing. But I'd had lots of fun, too. Then um, I kept my German up. I, it was my minor in college, and uh, I kept it up and met my husband at I- in Iowa, who's a German writer. And I met him because I was assigned as his translator, actually. And because of that, though, I often went back. I, the last time I was there for an extended period of time was in 80-81. I was there for about one and a half years, all total and did freelance work for the radio stations, features on American poetry, things like that. You obviously have a very diverse background, born and raised in Akron, Ohio. You currently live in uh, Tempe, Arizona. Got it right for the first time. Lived in Germany. I have a sense in these first two books that um, you're covering a lot of ground. Are your um, themes getting pared down into, are they getting more focused in the next book? Well, you're right, first of all, absolutely, that there is a large territory being covered in the two books. And just quickly, I think, to talk about that, what happened with me was that I was a very, I grew up in Akron, Ohio, and I hadn't really left the state. I went to school in Miami of Ohio, and um, I hadn't really left the state, you know, uh, until I graduated, then I went to to Europe, and it made such. It was really had a profound impact on me because there was a world out there. This world saw things differently than America sees things, um, and all of these changing viewpoints, these perspectives, um, made me realize that there is no one truth and there's no one way of seeing things. So I have been dealing with that in, in I think both books and a sense of displacement once you are committed to to um, looking at or exploring many different perspectives to a single event or a single idea, then you you become a citizen of the world and then in effect you are displaced wherever you are, but you're at home wherever you are too. That first, the third, the book now that's that's coming out next year is called Thomas and Beulah. It is a story. It tells the lives of a black couple growing up in Akron, Ohio, from about 19, the beginning of the century to the mid 60s. The first section is Thomas's a viewpoint. They aren't persona poems. It's done in third person. Uh, the the other second section is from his wife's viewpoint, from Beulah's view, viewpoint. And though it seems like a narrowing of concerns, it's, it in a way it's coming home and dealing with my city, my you know landscape and exploring then I think the world of 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 private experiences through these two people. The first poem in this book also appears in, in my my next book, which is not yet out, I didn't realize at the time that it was going to become a series, and so I think this is as good a time as any to to uh, read a little bit from that new book. The poem is called Dusting. Every day a wilderness, no shade in sight. Beulah patient among knickknacks, the solarium a rage of light, a grain storm as her gray cloth brings dark wood to life. Under her hands, scrolls and crests gleam darker still. What was his name, that silly boy at the fair with the rifle booth, and his kiss, and the clear bowl with one bright fish rippling wound? Not Michael, something 
finer, each dust stroke a deep breath and the canary in bloom. Wavery memory, home from a dance, the front door blown open and the parlor in snow, she rushed the bowl to the stove, watched as the locket of ice dissolved, and he swam free. That was years before father gave her up with her name, years before her name grew to mean promise, then desert in peace, long before the shadow and son's accomplice, the tree, Maurice.